All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Get Healthy Tampa Bay podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Carrie Reller. And today we have a very special guest, Dr. Malathi Acharya, who is coming all the way from the San Francisco Bay Area to tell us all about her expertise. Dr. Malathi, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us who you are and what you do? Thank you, Dr. Reller. I'm super excited to be with you here today chatting. My name is Dr. Malti Acharya. I'm an integrative medicine specialist. I started off as an internal medicine doctor, so I'm board certified in internal medicine as well as hospice and palliative medicine. And I've also done a fellowship training in integrative medicine. I'm the founder of Ayur Integrative Medicine, and I offer integrative medicine expertise and services in the Bay Area. I help people diagnosed with cancer, navigate their cancer treatment journey. I give them the hope that that they can lead a full and satisfying life during and after treatment and help them take back control of their health. I love that. That's a beautiful way to put it. And I know we were chatting before, but in case our listeners don't know, what is integrative medicine? Integrative medicine or holistic medicine brings together treatments from the traditional Western allopathic system of medicine, and as well as from other systems, be it ancient systems like traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurveda or homeopathy or naturopathy, or complementary treatments like manual treatments, osteopathic manipulation, massage, all of those treatments. It brings, blends them together in a very intelligent as well as evidence-informed, science-informed way. So it's not a mishmash of this and that, but these are all brought together in an intelligent way, tailor-made for the person we are seeing. So that is what integrative or holistic medicine is. So we get to use the best things of all the systems of medicine and and to help our body heal. That's a lot. Yeah. And stay healthy. You had an entire fellowship on that and more than one year. So, I mean, clearly there's a lot to learn and to be offered. And you are saying that some of that, or a lot of most of it is all evidence-based as well, but it's to be combined with the traditional medicine that medical doctors and DOs learn in the Western world. Okay. That's the key of mm -hmm. this specialty, right? It's not, it's not you patients or people, clients don't have to choose between this or that. Often when we hear of holistic treatment centers, there's often it puts the client in a position where they have to choose one over the other. The great thing about integrative medicine is it blends everything. So, Mm -hmm. you know, in something like cancer, we know that the traditional treatments, namely surgery, chemotherapy, and radio radiotherapy are the standard of care. So what we have to offer just gives extra tools for the client or the patient to navigate their journey. Yeah, and what a more important time in someone's life when they're suffering with cancer to need these extra kind of, you know, uh, holistic treatments and therapies. So how did you get into this in the first place, if you don't mind me asking? I love to share this story. So I, I started off as an internal medicine physician. I, I actually worked in the hospital for the first nine years of my career as a hospitalist. And then I transitioned to the primary care setting. And when I transitioned, the, the, where I was practicing as a primary care physician, I had a younger panel of patients. And many of my patients were more from Asia or Southeast Asia. And they would always keep asking me, you know, doctor, what can we do naturally to get better or feel better? What what can we change in our diet? What other natural things can we do? And they would ask me, you know, if someone had an acute back pain and I would prescribe the NSAIDs to them, they would say, oh, no, no, what can I do naturally? What can I take in my diet that will help? And I would, you know, I would give them answers, but I wouldn't, in my opinion, I felt those answers were not satisfactory to me. So as I kept hearing it, I started looking for what I can learn to enhance my knowledge along those lines. You know, what are the natural things we can do? I'm sure there are a lot we can do. So I started looking. And I also felt that as I was practicing as a primary care physician, the Western system was very uh, disease-based paradigm. Like the patient had a few symptoms, you know, if those symptoms don't fall into a specific disease paradigm, often I would have nothing to help them or treat them. 
you know, we do tests and we say, okay, all the tests came back negative. Here's a patient left with these symptoms. I felt that I didn't offer any anything for them, satisfactory way of helping them with their symptoms. So these were the two things that made me start looking for other things. And that's how I came, ac came upon this fellowship at the Andrew Whale Center for Integrative Medicine. And I joined it. Yeah, I think that it makes a lot of sense. I mean, as, you know, medical doctors, especially in primary care, you know, the way that we learned was, you know, diagnose the disease and here's how you treat it. Here's the medication. And part of that, you know, maybe because maybe our education was funded by pharmacy or everybody can have their own opinion on it, but there's definitely things that have kind of been left out. So I think that there's all these new little niche specialties, if you will, like your integrative medicine and other things that can pick up some of these things that we really didn't have the time or, you know, the training for. And maybe it's just because med school should be longer. Maybe we need to learn more, you know, but I don't know. So we're left there with what we got. There's a lot to learn. <laughs> There's a lot to learn. And it's true. But what I learned in this fellowship bridged a lot of gaps for me, you know, mm -hmm. in knowledge. You know, our training is by no means short, but there's a lot more to learn. And if I have to look back, I wish we had more nutrition training in med yeah. school. Because while I would give, you know, I would give advice to my patients, you know, giving advice coming from a position of really deep understanding and knowledge is different from giving the, you know, the tip of the iceberg advice. So that's why how I felt the difference was. Absolutely. So, so how does integrative medicine kind of complement traditional cancer treatment? Absolutely. What do you, what do, you do so, in your practice? Mm -hmm. So the way that integrative medicine helps uh, a person diagnosed with cancer in their cancer journey are, are many fold. One is that it helps, It there's a lot of anxiety, sadness, grief, despair when someone is diagnosed with cancer. And a lot of these feelings, they kind of trigger stress in our body. And we know there's, there is enough ample evidence that such a stress, uh, you know, being in such a state of stress does not make it conducive for someone to receive the treatment and heal from cancer. So one of the biggest applications would be to help the patient with symptoms of anxiety, depression, insomnia, sleep disturbances, et cetera, and prepare them for cancer treatment. Also, you know, the diagnosis of cancer triggers feeling of hopelessness, helplessness, anger, and people also have their own views of a particular cancer based on their previous experience, someone or someone, a family member or friend or what they've heard, they have, often there are preconceived notions that can interfere with our ability to receive and heal from treatment. So treatments like hypnosis, clinical hypnosis, specifically tailored for this, come into play where it helps the, you know, calm that mindset and helps the person receive the treatment and increases the efficacy of those treatments by helping the body, you know, also kick in with its innate healing potential. A uh, lot of nutrition, uh, you know, exercise, physical activity interventions are known to help improve outcome, improve survival and reduce recurrence, especially in breast cancer and many, many other cancers. So that's one application. Acupuncture, acupuncture from the traditional Chinese medicine helps to deal with the side effects of cancer treatment like chemotherapy induced nausea, vomiting, or, you know, general cancer pain or neuropathy, you know, from peripheral neuropathy, which is often a side effect of cancer treatment, as well as arthralgias mm -hmm. from aromatase inhibitors. So acupuncture is one, you know, Ayurveda, the principles of Ayurvedic medicine can be used, again, in manipulating the diet and activity of the patient to optimize healing. So there are these wonderful modalities that we can bring in from different systems that will help the person, you know, help them heal better, receive the treatment better and stay healthy once the treatment is completed. And when you say you're treating an anxiety and depression, you're not meaning, okay, you're going to give like a medication for it. You're meaning you're using these integrative principles that are going to help with that instead, correct? There are different ways to do that. Yes, some mm -hmm. patients may need medications. I'm not taking that away at all, but there are others that benefit from other interventions like mindfulness practices, mm -hmm. yoga, tai chi, physical activity, time in nature, you know, exploring one's spirituality, what gives joy, meaning, purpose. These are all what 
make up you know integrative medicine so yes medicines have their place but there are some many people who may not need medicines but they need these other tools that are well within their own control that can help them on the path of healing and recovery just going back to our training, like I remember maybe one afternoon of acupuncture, one afternoon of Tai Chi and things like that. And that was it. Right. <laughs> so yeah, this is really important. You, you didn't mention it, but you did some work in palliative care as well, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So is I, that I, also how you led maybe to what you're doing now? So a lot of principles of integrative medicine is very applicable in pal palliative medicine also. Um, I feel that in palliative medicine, a lot of them were applied, you know, where they would, you know, the social connections, uh, a lot of uh, integrate holistic treatments were already there in place, but at a different time along the, the life and journey of a patient. But I think bringing it out and applying it to everybody in every phase of their life and not just someone in the end of their life journey is what I feel is integrative medicine. There's a lot of similarity between the two. So I definitely, what I did as a, as a certified physician, especially in my inpatient hospital work, definitely helped shape my experiences, mm -hmm. you know, as I've now come out to be an integrative physician. So you mentioned acupuncture, and I think you were trying to t say it's good for peripheral neuropathy. Is that correct? After yes, acupuncture so, helps with mm -hmm. symptoms of peripheral neuropathy, right? Yeah. So I have a patient who had, you know, probably I think chemo for I can't remember what kind of cancer, but she's definitely experiencing peripheral neuropathy. Now, how do I go around navigating? trying to refer her to acupuncture and is, is that something that might be covered and and in your practice do you do the acupuncture or refer that out so i'm certified in medical acupuncture it's a course that course. physicians can do to get certified so i'm certified in medical acupuncture but there are you know the, the key thing about who to refer the patient to is finding a provider who has been trained in acupuncture. So mm -hmm. there are these certification spec boards, National Board of you know, Acupuncture Chinese Medicine, where you can look up certified acupuncture professionals and refer them out. Question of whether it's covered by insurance or not, that's really highly variable. Some of them do, some of them don't. Some insurance policies include acupuncture services. That is very variable. Mm -hmm. So do you know exactly like how that works? Like how does it help with the peripheral neuropathy? So the acupuncture works along the traditional Chinese medicine principles. So energy or chi in the body flows along certain specified energy channels called the meridians. That's the belief in traditional Chinese medicine. And when there is a disturbance to the flow of energy along these meridians in our body, whether the disturbance can be whether the excessive energy or depleted energy or blockage of energy, then the various symptoms are caused, you know, the, whether it be pain or neuropathy. So manipulating the energy along these energy channels using the needles, the acupuncture needles, brings back the balance and re restores the energy flow and offers symptom relief. That is the belief. That's what TCM, acupuncture, is based on. Traditional okay. Chinese medicine acupuncture is based on. Okay, that makes sense. So switching gears a little bit, you mentioned personalized treatment plans and like a personalized approach. How does that work with working with the patients who are diagnosed with cancer in your case? There are different tools and modalities we can use. So, so starting from anything as dietary interventions, right? We know that including certain foods, avoiding certain food, foods, they're all beneficial. So starting from dietary interventions, taking into account a person's culinary and cultural preferences to food, which is very important to determine compliance, right? So this is not something where we are going to give a one set of, oh, this is what you'll have, for, these are the things you'll have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's working with the play, client, working with the patient, finding out what their culinary and cultural preferences are. Okay, here is the, you know, the Mediterranean diet pattern is very inclusive in that way because it's just a, a, a formula, a pattern of diet. So here you include whole grains. So what whole grains do you like? What have you used in your culture? So what are your taste preferences? So so starting from that very point, you know, including, you know, the vegetables, the whole grains and spices that 
to the liking. Start, even a little thing as nutrition and food, starting from where the person is and taking into consideration what they like and what they don't like. You know, physical activity. Again, what, what do you prefer? What gives you pleasure? Because something that we don't enjoy doing, nobody's going to do it on a long-term basis. And again, anxiety, stress management, mindfulness. There are several tools that help us. Mindfulness, breath work, meditation, yoga, tai chi. It's picking out, working with them to pick out which one resonates the most with them. So that's that's what I mean by whole, you know, personalized care based on what you like and what you would like to do. And this integrative or holistic medicine addresses not just the physical body and the physical symptoms, but also the mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Yeah, absolutely. So you said mindfulness, meditation, breath work, yoga, tai chi are all different things that can help with like that mind-body connection and they can help promote like a better emotional well-being, right? Absolutely. And you mentioned whole grains and things, but are there, are there any other particular foods or supplements that have demonstrated kind of positive effects in these kind of patients? So a Mediterranean pattern of diet, which right. includes whole grains, uh, a, a range of color, a range meaning a, a range along all the color spectrum the rainbow. of vegetables, <laughs> rainbow yeah. color, vegetables and fruits, yeah. because the, the color in each of them indicates a particular phyto plant nutrient that they mm -hmm. have. So including a wide range of vegetables and fruits in our diet is definitely, definitely beneficial because especially cruciferous family, vegetables belonging to the crucifers, you know, the cabbage, cauliflower, kale, broccoli, they have nutrients like sulforaphones and glucosinolates that actually help fight cancer. So that's one big thing. Fats from healthy sources, polyunsaturated or monounsaturated fats like uh, olive oil, canola oil. So fats are not bad. It's just what type of fat we consume and what source is important. So including healthy fats, nuts and seeds, because they again bring in the variety of polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory by their nature. A variety of beans and legumes and proteins predominantly from plant-based because we know that plant-based foods help us fight that inflammation, which is also an element in cancer to keep that inflammation minimal and low. Fish, you know, fish is containing uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Again, omega-3 fatty acids are a key vital component to fight inflammation in our body. So they are also included. Red meat is minimized, you know, two to three servings a week is what is recommended. Fiber, which is a very, very important part of our diet because of how it helps our microbiome uh, to regulate our microbiome. In the, and the it determines the type of bacteria, good or the bad bacteria that predominate in our you know, body microbiome system. So these are all, and, and restricting the carbohydrates. So restricting and the type of carbohydrates are very, very important. So whole grains are more preferred than processed grains because a processed grain, the processing of the grains removes the nutrients mm -hmm. and exposes just the bare carbohydrates, which then spike in our body, increase the you know glucose level, you know perpetuates insulin resistance. So whole grains, where the grain has the cover and the bran and everything covering it, prevents that when we process the whole grains in our body, when we digest it, I should not use the word process, when we digest and absorb it, what happens is not a spike in the level of sugars, but a rather a slow increase and a mm -hmm. maintenance. So we don't get into the insulin resistance mode. So the type of carbohydrates and restricting the carbohydrates, these are all the important things. The other fascinating finding is that the timing of our meals is also important. So keeping up with the circadian rhythm and overnight fasting of at least 13 hours where we are not eating any food, we are not exposing our body to the absorbing food and uh, the, the digestion process is quietened and there is no strain on the body from blood sugars increasing. So overnight fasting of 13 hours has improved you know, outcomes in cancer treatments. So it's basically the type of food and also the timing of food are two key things that helps improve our health and outcomes. So what I'm hearing is the same thing that I tell my patients to prevent cancer and chronic diseases is pretty much the same diet that you're or not, you know, diet pattern of eating, whatever we're going to call it to treat cancer as well. So 
you, you mentioned health, the phytochemicals right. and antioxidants getting in the rainbow of foods, limiting the saturated fats and red meats and more fish and things. So the Mediterranean pattern of eating is like always winning. I feel like so. Always yeah. Winning. What about like supplements or like the red wine thing? What about that with related to cancer treatment? You know, with respect to wine, there is no safe level of alcohol intake is what, you know, we integrated mm -hmm. physicians believe in. So avoiding alcohol intake is what is most beneficial. I know there was a lot of back and forth on this, but mm -hmm. in terms of cancer prevention, no, no amount of alcohol is a safe amount of alcohol. So alcohol... And sugar sweetened beverages are the two things we, we recommend avoiding. Mm -hmm. What about a patient? You mentioned like preventing insulin resistance or leading to it. What about if the patient already has, you know, diabetes or insulin resistance and cancer? So it's important to address the insulin resistance because being in an insulin resistant state where the level of insulin is high, the level of blood sugars are high, the level of insulin-like growth factor is high, is a state where the, the body is primed to make more cancers or primed for more cell division, you know. So that's not a state we want to be in in someone with cancer or in someone who has been treated and we are working towards minimizing the chances of recurrence. So insulin resistance is something that needs to be addressed. And it, you know, it's addressed in a very multifactorial way. One is important is what type of food. Again, the same way, addressing what type of food is very important for insulin resistance. Physical activity is very important to break out of that state of insulin resistance. Also, there are other things. Stress management is very important to break out of the state of insulin resistance. So addressing stress management, that's important. Focusing on sleep. So the, that, you know, addressing insulin resistance is again, you know, we have to, different facets, we have to address and attack, attack, you know, look at it from all directions and, you know, treat everything that's contributing to that. And then I think I asked before, but is there any supplements that you kind of recommend for treating? So the supplements is not one thing fits all. Right. You know, the, some of the most significant uh, things I want to, supplements of important things I want to mention in cancer protectiveness are one is vitamin D. It's very important that I know there is a, there is a lot of research now that tell us that Low levels of vitamin D predispose us to cancer. Not only that, in someone diagnosed with cancer, someone with a lower vitamin D level has does not respond as much to treatment and has a higher chance of recurrence and death. So maintaining the vitamin D levels. So checking the levels to make sure the level is normal. If it is low to replace and then maintain the levels is very, very important. Even, you know, in everybody and mm -hmm. specifically in patients diagnosed with cancer. That's one thing. Another uh, uh, supplement that is very important, I would say very vital is omega-3 fatty acids because they play a key role in reducing the inflammation. So the omega-6 fatty acids are pro-inflammatory. They support inflammation. The omega-3 are the opposing the good guys. So omega-3 fatty acids, for those of them who eat, consume fish as part of their diet, from oily fish or as supplements. That's one of the important supplements, I would say. And I, and the uh, the third one I would mention is curcumin, you know, the active ingredient from turmeric. So again, if there is one supplement that I would, I would across the board caution and recommend and call out for everybody to make sure it's checked and it's appropriately maintained at level of 20 to 30 is vitamin D. It's universal. I mean, we can't go wrong with that. What do you think? Why um, insurance isn't like paying for that one? I actually don't know. I have no idea why. I know yeah. that, you know, initially there's a lot of back and forth on that. When I was a primary care physician, there was always this question, who do you test? And do you mm -hmm. test everybody? But, you know, as I delved into my integrative, you know, curriculum and as I emerged as an integrative physician, the evidence is very clear. And now I know that you know, I would test everybody and make sure their levels are. Yeah, it I, seems I like to be related to so many different things. And just because I feel yes. like the evidence that treating it doesn't change the outcome sometimes is what some of the studies show. But yes, you just said the opposite. The studies used to show. Used to, yeah, yeah you just said the opposite. That's what mm -hmm. they used to show. But 
there are recent studies that clearly show an improved outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is true. I still, yeah, I still get it denied. So I just basically say, hey, I'm going to order this and I'm going to call you vitamin D deficient so it gets paid for. And then we'll assess whether you actually it's are or tough. not. Yeah. And we know that, you know, as uh, you know, we know that vitamin D adequate levels are important for asthma control in someone mm -hmm. who has yeah. uncontrolled asthma. We know that ulcerative colitis. So we knew these isolated pockets. So the, the underlying theme is that vitamin D helps our immune cells to function better. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, when I understand and think of all of these things, vitamin D has an effect on how our immune cells function. And we need to make sure that it's adequate for us to be, so immune cells have to function not only in preventing infection, but also in, in the cancer prevention pathway for us. Because we are exposed to so many stimuli that are cancer causing and our body is actually working hard every single day to, you know, neutralize the stimuli and, you know, keep us on the healthy balance and you know we need our immune cells to function at their best efficacy for that and that's how vitamin D. absolutely yeah are there any other things that kind of boost and support the immune system that you would recommend adequate sleep again you know it, it's the same things that you, you're going to hear me say yeah. again and again right it's diet physical activity stress management stress management is very mm -hmm. key you know chronic stress anxiety depression causes cortisol stimulation serum cortisol all you know it dampens the function of our immune system so that is one and the other the key thing to remember is feeling ne negative emotions like feeling of helplessness hopelessness which often uh, happens with the cancer diagnosis they also negatively affect our immune cells and they suppress our body the capacity of our immune cells to work against the cancer and help our body heal. So addressing those emotions is very important. You know, whether therapy, other mind-body tools, especially hypnosis is very powerful from that perspective. Sleep, adequate sleep is important for our immune system to function. Yeah, I saw you had some extra training in hypnosis. And do you work that into your current practice model? Yes, I'm level one and level two certified in hypnosis. And the hypnosis and acupuncture, I use them more for my clients rather than I don't offer a la carte acupuncture right. or hypnosis. Or I just work them into what I do. Okay. So is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? You know, our body has our innate capacity to heal, but we can do so many things to help and augment that innate capacity to heal along with, you know, proven evidence-based treatments from Western medicine as well. So a true integrative physician would never put anyone at crossroads of what to choose because, you know, we have to have the ability to choose the best from all the worlds. And that is what integrative medicine is about. And it's just not about treating a disease or a condition. These principles apply very well for someone to remain healthy also and like age that. with vitality. Age with vitality. I like that. Very good. And where can people find you? Absolutely. You can find me on my website at www.ayur.today. I'm also on Facebook. My profile is Malti Acharya. I'm on Instagram. My Instagram handle is Dr. Malti2023. And I'm on LinkedIn as well as Dr. Malti. And can you tell me why you picked the name of the practice that you have? Ayur in Sanskrit means life. Mm -hmm. So... It's all about life and healthy living and enhancing our lives. <laughs> I love I it. Well, I thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. And I hope everybody enjoyed this talk. I thought it was awesome. And please tune in next week. And if you're looking for a primary care provider or obesity medicine doctor or allergist in Clearwater, Florida, look up Clearwater Family Medicine and Allergy in Clearwater and Palm Harbor. All right. Tune in next week. Bye, everybody.